Hello, everyone. Okay, I see two people on. Can you hear me? <gasps> Yara. Good evening. <laughs> I'm new to this live streaming, so I hope you guys can hear me. <gasps> Lexi. Yay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I, I hope you guys can hear me. And um, yeah, we're going to do... Chapter eight, that's what the plan was. What do you guys think? Hybridization, molecular orbitals. <gasps> Alex! <laughs> wow, this is like, this is very surreal. <laughs> this is the first time that I'm going live, so it's, it's kind of crazy. Okay. So, what are we doing? I was figuring that we would go through the advanced theories of covalent bonding. I believe in the, uh, the two E book, that's chapter eight. So do we want to go over hybridization? How are we with, uh, hybridization knowing our SP, SP two and SP three. So these guys, right? SP, we have SP two and SP three and how to, um, decipher this. I got to put this up. Yay! <laughs> Woohoo! This is great. I'm already having a lot of fun. This could be this could be a new thing, guys. Anyway. Okay. So, um I guess let's start with hybridization, right? So, I'm going to pull up a question. Let's see. I'm going to dive in. I'm going to look in the back of the chapter in chapter 8. And let's try to figure out how to do these hybridizations. Okay, so let's see. I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking probably number 27 is a good question. We got A through G going on over here. So I'm going to pull one up. So let's see. So let's, let's pull one up, shall we? Okay. Woohoo! All right, so we have Cl2CO, and they say that C is the central atom, and we need to find out the hybridization. So maybe the first thing what I'll do is I'll pull this over a little bit over here because we have this, like, watermark over here that I don't know why it's there, but I can't get rid of it. So we need to find the hybridization of the central atom. Basically, you have three answers. Is it going to be SP? Is it going to be SP2? Or is it going to be SP3? Let's figure it out. So the, the best way to do this, guys, is pen, pen and paper. We need, uh, do we need a periodic table for this? Not really. But I would suggest writing down with me um, because I'm going to have to erase at some point. Whoa, what happened there? Okay. I'm going to have to erase at some point. So probably just write down with me. Okay, guys? All right. So first things first is let's list out all of the hybridizations. We have SP, SP2, and SP3. Now, I don't know, for some classes, you might actually have to do SP3D, um, but I don't see that in here. So we're just going to do the three of them, okay? All right. So the easiest way to figure this out is look at how many letters there are here. Literally, there's an S and a P. There's an S and two P's, right? This squared up top means that you have two P's. And then you have SP3, right? So you have three P's. So the best thing is, is to just write out and say, how many letters do you actually have? Well, SP is basically saying you have S and a P. And then for SP2, you have S, P, P, because you have two P's, P, P. And then for the other one, you have S, P, P, and P, right? You have three P's. So in the grand scheme of things, how many total letters are there? Well, for the first one, for SP, I only have two letters. For SP2, I have three letters. And for the final one, for SP3, I have four letters. I hope everybody is following along. 
And if you have any questions, just put it in the comments, okay? So now, this is what is going to be basically saying about what's going on in your compound. So now I'm going to translate it into chemistry language. Instead of saying two letters, I like to say two things. Three letters, three things. And then four letters, I have four things. Now, you might be saying, Christina, what, what is a thing? So, that's what we're going to be doing now. We have, to, we have to just say, what is a thing? So maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase this. So hopefully you guys got that. Because basically, just translate the letters into things, right? So this is going bye-bye. I'm going to move this over here. Four letters, four things, three letters, three things, and two letters, two things, right? So now what is a thing? Well, one thing is either a single bond, so one line, remember a single bond is one line, one double bond, so remember a double bond is two lines, and then one triple bond, which is three lines. One last thing is one lone pair. So basically two dots, right? One lone pair is two dots. These are all of your things. So I have a single bond, I have a double bond, I have a triple bond, or a lone pair. Keep in mind that a double bond has two letters, or like two lines, but we will classify it as one thing. Okay? Okay. Now with that background, all we have to do is just figure out how many things are around these atoms, and then we'll figure out the hybridization. So I'm just going to erase this. Hopefully you guys wrote that down. So it's going away. And now let's look at this compound. Now they did give us a little bit of a heads up. They say that C is the central atom. So that means that carbon has to be in the middle. And then I have two chlorines. I have one oxygen. So they have to be around the central atom, which is carbon. So I'm going to put maybe my chlorine and my chlorine down here, and then my oxygen over here. And now we just have to figure out what the Lewis structure is. Whenever you're doing hybridization, we have to find out what the Lewis structure is, okay? So this is like last chapter, so this will be a good review. Remember, these go based off of the valence electrons. So I guess periodic table, right? Carbon has four valence electrons, so I'll draw four dots around carbon. Each chlorine has seven valence electrons, so seven dots are going around the chlorine. Seven apiece. Wee. And then six uh, electrons, six valence electrons are around oxygen, so I'm going to put six. And then, ooh, sorry. And then remember, single bonded up. So single bond, single bond, single bond, right? And then just make sure, do you have the octet? Nah, carbon has two, four, six, seven electrons. So it needs to double up and the oxygen needs to as well. So you'll have a double bond here. Okay. How is this thus far? Hopefully this is good. Now, what we're going to do is the hybridization. Now, the thing is here, guys, that Every single element can have a different hybridization. The whole molecule does not have one single hybridization. These hybridizations are for the individual elements. So technically, we could do four different hybridization questions, right? In number 27, they just wanted the central atom, but let's just do all of them, right? So let's focus on, let's see, let's focus on the chlorine. 
Maybe I'll make this a little bigger. Here we go. Let's focus on that chlorine, right? How many things are around this chlorine? Well, I have one lone pair. That was one thing, right? Remember, a lone pair is two dots. I have another lone pair, so that's two things already. I got another lone pair, and then I have the single bond. You only count the things that are connected to the chlorine, right? I can't count this double bond. I can't count this single bond. I don't care about any of these other electrons for this chlorine because it's not affected by it. So how many things? One, two, three, four, four things, four letters, SP3. So this chlorine would have SP3 hybridization. Now let's do it for the carbon. So we only care about what's going on with the carbon. So if we zone in on this carbon, right, if we only look at this carbon, what does the carbon have? Well, it's got a single bond. It's got another single bond. And it's got a double bond, right? I can't count any of these lone pairs because they're not attached to the carbon. The carbon only has a single bond, another single bond, and a double bond. How many things, guys? Three things, right? One single, one single, one double. That's three things. So then you say to yourself, three things, three letters, SP2. Oh my goodness. And then if you want to do the other oxygen, go for it, right? How many things are around this oxygen? A double bond, one lone pair, another lone pair. That's three things. So three things, three letters, SP2. If we want to just do this one, I mean, it's identical to this one. So it has to be the same hybridization, but you could always double check on that one. So this one was also SP3. But that's basically how you would do a hybridization problem. It all stems from the Lewis structure. If you guys don't have the Lewis structure correct, it might not go well. But tons of problems with Lewis structures, right? Okay. Questions on this? I'm looking in the comments. Any questions on this specific idea? Do you guys want to do another one? Well, I take a sip of my tea. Okay, here we go. Hold on. Oop. I see one, so let me post it up. Okay, do lone pairs matter in hybridization after you collected them as things? Not sure if this question makes sense. Um, lone pairs do matter because it is classified as one thing. So you would only group the lone pair and call it one thing. So like for the oxygen, I would group this lone pair and say one thing. Here is another lone pair. That's also one thing. So maybe I'll just say one thing. And then the double bond. That's another thing. Does that kind of make sense? Do lone pairs matter in hybridization after you collected them as things? Oh, um, like do, maybe, you were, uh, maybe you were saying do electrons actually have a hybridization? The electrons don't have a hybridization. Only the elements. So you'll only use those electrons if you, you know, talk about the actual element. But that's that for that. Hopefully that answers your question. Lexi. Any other questions or how do we feel about this? Oh my God, I'm, sp I'm spilling my tea all over the place. Hey, I'm a mess. <laughs> Okay, let's see. So any other questions on this idea? Do you guys want to do maybe another one? Or do you want to move on to something else? Let's see, let's scan chapter eight. <clears throat> um, let's see. 
For each of the following structures, determine the hybridization requested and whether the electrons will be delocalized. Ooh. What does delocalized mean? That's interesting. Do you guys need to know what delocalized means? I'm going to erase this example. And maybe we will do a delocalization question. So let's do this lovely one. This one is coming from number 30, letter B. So I'm just going to, I'm going to get rid of this one. Goodbye. And this is the new one right here. And they actually draw it. So that's kind of beautiful. Let's figure out what the hybridization is for these three elements. And then we're going to talk about something called delocalization, because in the question it says, can these electrons, these dots or the bonds, can they be delocalized? So I'm just going to put a star down here and not over here because we'll put it over here. Delocalized. Okay. So hybridization. What do you think for these, this one, guys? What do you think the hybridization of this oxygen is? SP? SP2 or SP3? How many things are there? What do you guys think? Looks like to me, there's a double bond, one lone pair, another lone pair. That looks like three things to me. Three things, three letters. This is SP2. Let's look at this sulfur. Oop, what happened to that? There you go. So this sulfur, what are around, or, you know, what is around the sulfur? We got a double bond, a single bond, and a lone pair. That's three things. So, SP2. Pay no attention to the charges. The charges are just an indication whether you have gained electrons or lost electrons. But the plus or the negative doesn't mean anything for as far as electrons, just signifying whether that sulfur lost an electron or gained it. So you don't classify, you don't take that into consideration when you're doing hybridization. And then this oxygen, how many things? One, two, three. Three, four, so four things, four letters. This is SP3. So that one's pretty easy. Hopefully this makes sense, guys. Now let's go in terms of can these electrons be delocalized? Okay, so the first thing what I'm going to do is I'm just going to erase this because I do want a little bit of space for what's going to happen here. I'm going to bring this up. I think that's good. Beautiful. Okay. So delocalization. Basically delocalized is a fancy word for saying that these electrons can move. Well, how do the electrons move? This is all because of resonance. You might have seen this in your class, but basically, if you can form a resonance structure, those electrons are delocalized because what is a resonance structure? It's just basically another picture. It's another representation of um, this compound because the electrons can jump. It can move. Now, usually... You could draw these different pictures, right, when you see charges. This oxygen being a negative charge is like, oh, I'm not happy. I want to be like this oxygen. I want to be neutral. This oxygen, I don't see a charge, right? There was no positive. There was no negative. So there's no charge. But this oxygen is like, ugh, I wish I was neutral, but I'm negative, but there's a charge on the sulfur, which can make it possible. 
Now, what's going to happen is these electrons, they're going to start moving. And this one electron, or this pair, or this pair, it doesn't matter which pair, but in order for this oxygen to turn into this one, which is neutral, one of these electrons is going to do what, guys? Do you see how in this one, there was only two lone pairs and two bonds? So what's going to happen? This is going to jump in and turn into a bond. And when that happens, maybe if I get rid of this, when that happens, this oxygen on this side will only have two electrons. And now this will be a double bond to the sulfur, which has the one lone pair, right? We didn't touch this at all. And then this has one uh, double bond, and then this has the one like that. But now, there was only three bonds here. So basically, if you make a bond here, what are you going to do on the other side? Especially since they are the same element, right? They're two oxygens. So if you make the bond, what are you going to have to do here? You're going to have to break it. So one of these bonds now go as lone pairs. And they're always going to go to the more electronegative atom. So between oxygen and sulfur, oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur. So these electrons that were in this bond, right? Remember, there was like two electrons here. These are going to go, oh boy, oh boy. I thought I was going to be, oh boy. <laughs> let me do it. Let me do it like this. These, I still can't get it. Oh my goodness. Okay. I was going to do like a little move. But basically, these electrons now go over here. And do you see how basically these two swapped, right? This was the double bond with the two lone pairs. Now it's over here. And this is now the single bond with the three lone pairs, and that was over here. So what do you think the charge of this oxygen is going to be? It's going to be negative. And the sulfur, since it didn't change, it stays as a positive. And that's what it means by electrons moving. They're being delocalized. They're not staying in one place. So if you have basically like double bonds and single bonds with lone pairs of electrons and the same element, chances are those electrons will be delocalized. Hopefully this makes sense. Let me know in the chat. Hopefully. We'll see. Oh, wow, I wasn't even, oh my goodness, hold on. Sorry, guys. I thought I was stuck on the chat. Let's see, hold on. Oh, okay, Lexi says, okay, Lexi says, what about sigma and pi bonds? We'll definitely get to that. Okay. Alex, SP3, yeah, there was definitely an SP3 one over there. Whoa! <laughs> Super chat from Trevor. Oh, thanks, Trevor. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so Lexi says, so electrons get delocalized when there's a negative charge on one atom, or does the charge not matter? This is a great question. Chances are, if you do see a negative charge with a double bond next door, then it probably will be delocalized. But let me give you another example, if I can. Like, I don't understand why the electrons need to move them. Okay. So let's answer, actually, so I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to answer this one first. Like, I don't understand why the electrons need to move in the first place. Okay. All of chemistry, and this is like basically all, you know, the whole thing of chemistry, is that it always comes down to two things. It comes down to energy and stability. If you have the lowest energy possible, that's the most stable, right? Let's focus on the stability for here. How are we going to show stability with covalent bonding? We show them when there are neutral atoms. If you have a neutral atom, that atom is happy, and it's neutral, and it's stable, and it's, it's chilling. 
if you have a negative atom, this atom is basically not happy, right? It wants to be neutral. So these electrons will jump around because it's more stable to basically have two different structures going back and forth and back and forth and sharing this negative charge than one, elect one atom just, you know, holding the negative charge all by itself. That's why these electrons move. Because it's easier on the system if this oxygen has the negative for a little bit, and then it jumps over here. And then it goes back. And then it goes back here. The more resonance structures, the more delocalization, this, this, the uh, more stable the structure is as a whole. So that's why these electrons jump. Because it's all about stability, and it's, it's basically sharing. It's sharing those charges so that one single atom doesn't have to hold the charge forever. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> Andrew says, she's the best. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> okay. So let's see. Yara says... Makes sense. Thank you. I had a question about number 22. For N2F2, I found seven regions. So how would I go about finding its molecular structure? Okay. So we'll definitely get to that one. I'll keep that in mind, number 22. I just want to make sure. Any questions on uh, hybridization while I, let's, I'm just going to look up number 22. Yeah, there you go, Michael. Electrons need to move to become more stable. And that's totally true. The more movement that those electrons can have, the more stable that the whole compound as a whole will be. So delocalization and resonance is a good thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, could you answer the first question I had, please, about delocalization where there's a negative charge on one atom? Um, yeah, so this question, right? So electrons get delocalized uh, when there's a negative charge on one atom, so there's, so, or does the charge not matter? So, for example, sometimes you can get delocalized and sometimes you can't. So if we just look at, so I'm just going to basically remove um, this idea. Hopefully you guys wrote that down. So let's do, so basically let's do like this. We'll do this carbon. We'll do a hydrogen and a hydrogen and then another hydrogen and then an oxygen. And this will be negative. And then we'll do, um, we'll do basically this idea. We have NO2 and NO2 looks like this. It has a nitrogen in the middle with two oxygens, basically like this. Okay, so I have two different ideas here. Maybe I'll do this, yeah, okay. And this nitrogen is positive, these oxygens will be negative. So basically, for my two examples, I have oxygens, both, you know, oxygens in both compounds have the same uh, negative charge. So let's see, can we delocalize this one or can we delocalize this one? Let's look at this one first. Now remember, this oxygen says, ugh, I'm negative, I want to you know, make this stable, right? So what's gonna happen, it's, it's going to try to make that bond because oxygen loves to have two bonds, it doesn't like to have one bond. It wants to have this uh, double bond so that it could be neutral, right? If we focus in on this, this oxygen has two bonds and it doesn't have a charge. But let's see, if this comes in and I now have a double bond here, right? Can this be possible? Look at that carbon. How many bonds will the carbon have? 
two, four, six, eight, ten. Ay. And there's no other double bond that it can break. Usually you'll form a double bond and then you'll break a double bond. But if this one is formed, I can't break. I can't break a, a you know, a single bond. So in this case, even though there was an oxygen that was negative, it can't get delocalized because there's no other option. But now in this case, I do have an oxygen that's negative. It's going to want to make that double bond. And when it does, we strip away one lone pair because the one lone pair goes and, and you know, is that double bond. But then the nitrogen says, well, hold on. I have two, four, six, eight, ten electrons. Can I break a bond? If I made this one, I can break one of these. And these will go back to the oxygen. And now this one will be negative. And do you see how the cycle like keeps repeating? So then maybe this would have the double bond and this one would go back to its single. So really delocalization happens when you can make a bond, but then you can break it. In this case, you couldn't have broken a bond because there was no double bonds to do it. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Let's see. I'm going to erase this. Woohoo. Okay, so let me just get rid of that. I hope I hope that answered the question. Yay! Okay. All right. Um Okay. Number 22. What's going on here? Let me just pull this one up. Can I pull this one up? I think I can. Okay. So this one, I'm going to pull up the whole question. Number 22. Whee. Okay. And then maybe let me bring it down a little bit because of this thing. Hopefully you guys can see the question. So it says, in addition to NF3, two other floral derivatives of nitrogen are known, N2F4 and N2F2. What shapes do you predict? Okay, perfect. Before I answer this question, Josh just has one question. He says, so is this a constant process of breaking bonds then making them again? The answer is yes. If you do have delocalization and you do have resonance, the process is going to keep going on and on and on and on of breaking and making the bonds so that those uh, charges, the negative charge, can be distributed between the atoms. Awesome. Okay, so let's do shapes now. So hybridization, now we're going to use that hybridization and talk about the shapes. So it looks like we just need to find out the hybridization for N2F4 and N2F2. Okay, so let's do N2F4 over here and then N2F2 over here. Now this is going back to Lewis structures, right guys? So let's see. In both of these cases, we're gonna probably have the two nitrogens in the middle and then the, the fluorines distributed among the, uh, you know, the periphery. So let's see, I got nitrogen and nitrogen for both of these, N, N. What a wonky N. In this case, I have four fluorines, so I need to be fair. You got to be fair. That's my favorite saying. <laughs> if you if you guys have been watching the videos. Um, so you got to be fair. There's four fluorines. Let's just divvy them up equally. So probably I'll put, you know, one fluorine here, one fluorine here, one here, and one here. And then for this one, since I only have two fluorines, maybe I'll put one with one nitrogen and one with the other. It does not matter at this stage of the game whether you put it down here, you know, to interact with this, or you could put it on the edge. I'll just put it on the edge of glory. Okay. So, uh, Lewis structures, right? Nitrogen, remember, has five valence electrons on the periodic table. So we'll say one, two, three, four, five, right? I think nitrogen has five. Yeah, five. 
And then each flooring has, um, each flooring has seven. So we can just start adding the dots, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 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 And then the nitrogen has five, right? Okay. And maybe I'll put one over here. So let's do single bonded up and see what happens. So single bond, single bond, single bond, single bond, and single bond. Now let's see. Hmm, hmm, hmm. This nitrogen uh, doesn't look like it has the octet to me, right? It has, let's see, two, four, six. Oh, it does have, yeah, it does have two, four, six, and then it has eight. So I'm just going to clean this up, and I'm just going to put this right here. One, two. And then the same thing here, two, four, six, and then those two electrons have eight. So those are good. I'm just going to group them together, make them a pair. So I have this right now. Beautiful. And then for this one, it's basically the same. Five electrons. One, two, three, four, five, right? One, two, three, four, five. Each fluorine has seven. Eee, beautiful. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Single bond them up and see if you need double bonds. So let's see. Fluorines are in check. And now if I just look at this nitrogen, it has two, four, uh, six, and then seven. So in this case, we do need the double bond. Oh, yeah. So it looks like in this case, I got all single bonds. And in this case, I have a double bond in between the two nitrogens. So let's answer the first part. What is the hybridization for the nitrogen in each molecule? Let's see if you guys got it. Now, now, I'm, now I'm up to date with the chat, so uh, I'm going to see, see the answers. Let's see. What is the hybridization for the nitrogen? What do you guys think? SP, SP2, or SP3? Oh, yeah. That's right, Yara. It's SP3. There's four things around here. One, two, three. There you go. And four. Look at you guys. So SP3. And then if you do this, they look identical. So they have to be the same hybridization. So this one would also be sp3. What is the hybridization for this nitrogen? What do you guys think? <gasps> this is so much fun. <laughs> what do you guys think? sp, sp2. Or SP3. Josh says SP2. Yeah, that's right. You guys got it. Look at you guys. SP2. And since this one looks identical, it's got to be the same. SP2. Oh, yeah. All right, so that last end is done. Now, it says, what shapes do you predict for these two molecules? Okay. So now this is basically going over your geometry. How are you guys doing with your geometry? Whether it's like bent or if it's um, trigonal planar or if it's tetrahedral. How are you guys with that? There's an easy way to figure this out. And I think I'm just running through the textbook and I see that they basically... Um, let's see, do they do all of them or do they just want you to do like a general one? Yeah, it looks like, looks like they, they want you to do, they want you to just know the general idea. So here we go, guys. Um, yeah, what shapes do you predict for these two molecules? Okay, so 
if we have, and maybe I'll just put it in the middle here, right? And maybe I'll just like, you know, move this over a little bit. If you have a compound that has this, so let's just run through them, okay? So if you have a compound that has an element in the middle surrounded by three bonds and two lone pairs, or actually not two lone pairs, two dots, right? One lone pair. If you see this, this is called trigonal pyramidal. So the specific uh, geometry for this would be trigonal pyramidal. Trigonal pyramidal. This falls under the tetrahedral family because there are four things. But the specific molecular geometry would be classified as trigonal pyramidal. So anytime that you see three lone pair, uh, three single bonds and one lone pair, it's automatically trigonal pyramidal. And that's what these are, right? This nitrogen has three lone pairs, uh, sorry, three bonds and one lone pair, three bonds and one lone pair. So this shape would be trigonal pyramidal. Over on this side, if you see that you have two things and a lone pair, you see the difference there? So I'm just going to erase this. If you see that you have two things, so for example, maybe, maybe I have a carbon with a double bond and two um, single bonds, right? If you just basically have a total of three things, you see that, right? This is a double bond, a single and a single. And over here, it's a lone pair, a single and a double. But for each one of them, it's three things, right? Three things. This geometry would be called trigonal. So that word stays exactly the same, but it's not pyramidal. It's planar. So that's the difference here, guys, okay? This one is trigonal pyramidal. This one is trigonal planar. So you can have different, uh, you know, different types here. But just basically, if you have a total of three things, it's going to be trigonal planar. Hopefully, this makes sense. Yara says, let's see. So you have to split the molecule so you have one center atom from each. Yes. Basically, in this case, since these are symmetrical, you can basically just talk about one half. It's kind of weird that they said, like, what shape do you predict for these molecules? They made them symmetrical. So they're, they were only looking at, like, one half. So since whatever this is, it's going to be the same for this side. So the whole thing would basically be trigonal pyramidal for this and trigonal planar for this one. Hopefully that makes sense. What do you guys think? I know that there was a question before. Oh, okay. Sorry, Michael. Could you answer? Okay. I prove okay. Ba, 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 ba. Hold on. Sorry about that. Michael says, okay, this is slightly off topic, but I'm now moving into a new unit and it's all about kinetic molecular theory of gases. What exactly is the kinetic molecular theory of gases? Okay. So this is kind of going a little bit off topic. This is what I think chapter nine. Uh, this is the gas chapter. Basically, if you, um, have taken physics, Right? I don't know if you have, but you don't really need to take physics to know what this is. Right? Kinetic, uh, kinetic molecular theory, just like in a, in a nutshell, is basically talking about how fast molecules travel. So remember, kinetics or kinetic energy is anything that has to do with movement. So the kinetic uh, molecular theory of gases is basically just a theory that says that the 
higher the molecular mass or the higher the molar mass, the slower the speed is. So in return, if you have a lower molar mass and you don't weigh as much, you will be able to move at a much higher speed or velocity. That's like the overall general um, thing about this. Okay, hopefully that helps. <laughs> but yeah, that's basically all that, that it's talking about. Just basically how fast the molecules are moving, and then this is like the general consensus, that the, the more that it weighs, the slower it's going to be able to travel in a vessel. You got it. Okay. So, let's see. Oh my gosh. Wow, where did the time go? <laughs> time goes by fast when you're having fun. Um, let's see, Gerardo says... Could I request a different topic? I'm given this problem in my lab report that I have no idea how to approach. I'm doing questions around heat. Um, I mean, if it's, I mean, I don't know if I could answer the specific question because I, I don't have your, uh, your lab report, but I'll try to do my best if I can. Um, but I, I might not be able to. But in the meantime, let's do... Uh, Lexi says, ah, yeah, this is good. Sigma and pi bonds. So still with chapter eight. These are beautiful. So, so, so easy. So basically draw something out. Let's just say, you know, we've done tons of, tons of, uh, um, tons of, uh, structures, right? So let's just say that we have, I don't know, let's, let's make it kind of cool, right? So we have a carbon with a, actually, let's do a carbon. That's a single bond to an oxygen. That's, you know, carbon, which is double bound to an oxygen, right? And then let's just say that there's another carbon and then a triple bond. Getting crazy over here. Maybe I'll do a nitrogen here. Okay, let me just fill in the remaining stuff this should have let's just say that this has four hydrogens i'm just making it uh be the octet rule this oxygen has um two lone pairs this one has th uh, actually this one has two lone pairs as well okay everything is accounted for beautiful and before i answer this sunny just says will this be available for replay i logged in late uh i believe so yeah why not right <laughs> so Yes. Okay. It might not be up here forever. I mean, we might not, you might not be able to find it. We do have like, I don't know. We have a lot of videos, but it will be available. So yeah. Okay. Back to this. Sigma and pi bonds. So we basically just have to go down through the three different bonds. So for example, there's three different bonds, right? We know this. There's single bond. Then there's a double bond. And then there's the lovely triple bond. Now, the sigma bond, which is represented like this, I think it's maybe, I don't know, Greek, I think, right? Greek. This is sigma, so S-I-G-M-A. And the sigma bond is always the, basically it's like the groundwork. You can't move forward without a sigma bond. You can't build more bonds unless you lay that groundwork down, unless you lay that framework down, right? So every bond has to have at least one sigma bond. That's the groundwork. So... Here is a single bond. It's only got one bond. So this has to be a sigma bond. Here's a double bond. Gotta lay that framework down. 
So that one is at least a Sigma Bond. Does it matter which one I picked? This one or this one? Absolutely not. I'll just pick this one though. So this is one Sigma. And then here's a triple bond. I gotta lay the framework down. So that's one Sigma. All the other remaining bonds is like the aesthetics, right? And you build up from your Sigma bond. So pi, pi, is all of the additional bonds. Since there is no more additional bonds for a single bond, I have no pi bonds here. Since I have one more additional bond for a double bond, I have one pi bond. And then for a triple bond, since I have two additional bonds, I have two pi bonds. So basically, if we had to say, can we calculate the total number of sigma bonds and the total number of pi bonds in this drawing, what do you think? How many, let's start with the easier one first. How many pi bonds do you think is here? And I should have dropped this down a little bit more. I keep forgetting that there's this, this thing right there. Okay, how many pi bonds are there? Remember, a pi bond is only in a double bond and a triple bond. How many pi bonds? What do you guys think? Ooh, just cracked my neck. What do you guys think? Okay, Lexi says three. That's right. One, because you have one in the double, and two in the triple. There you go, Yara. So you got three. Perfect. Now, how many sigma bonds? What do you think? I'm counting it in my head. Some Sometime, hold on. Okay. Okay, Lexi says five, Yara says seven. Ooh, let's see. Okay, Lexi says, never mind. Let's see. One, because remember, all sig single bonds are pi bonds. Yeah, there we go. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight. Ah, there's eight. There you go. So we got eight sigma bonds and we have three pi bonds. Oh, yeah. What do you think? Hopefully this helps. This is basically, this is basically sigma and pi bonds in a nutshell. You can only get your sigma and pi bonds if you draw the Lua structure. It seems like the running theme of chapter eight is you got to draw the Lewis structure. <laughs> Without the Lewis structure, you basically got nothing. So draw the Lewis structure. And then from there, you can get your sigma bonds. You could get your pi bonds. I could even ask hybridization. I could ask geometry. So there's a lot of things that you can ask for from here. Okay. So that one's pretty cool. Let's see. I think we're coming toward, oh my goodness, what happened? I don't know what is going on. <laughs> As you can see, this is my first time on live. There we go. Okay. So, um, anything else? What do we think? So hybridization, hybridization is probably like the biggest part of this chapter. They keep asking for hybridization. They ask for geometry. But remember, you can't do any of those without drawing the, the Lewis structure first. So always draw the Lewis structure. And then you guys are good to go. Um, more hybridization, more geometry. Just scanning through the book. 
Um, yeah. I hope this is helping, guys. Okay, so Yara says, let's see. Yara says, oh, I'm doing great. Thank you. <laughs> Can we look at how to write the MO configuration in problem like number 38? Okay. So yeah, this will probably be, I think this is like the last major concept. Oh, oh boy. I just got rid of, oh, whatever. We didn't need it, right? Oh, not, thir not 38. Which one? This is probably the last big uh, thing for this chapter. So if we can do this, you guys have like the general overview of this chapter. So let's see. Okay, so 40. Let's see, let's look at 40. Okay, so predict the valence electron molecular orbital configurations for the following and state whether they will be stable or unstable ions. Okay. So let me get the, uh, so there's basically a diagram that depending on your teacher or professor, you might have to memorize, which I really, I really, really hope not. <laughs> um, or your teacher or professor might give it, give you this drawing, um, on your test or quiz. So let me just show you what I'm talking about. You've probably seen these. It's the dreaded these. <laughs> so you've probably seen these. I don't know whether um, you have to memorize the, this drawing or whether you have to um, draw it, you know, on your test or quiz, or maybe your teacher might give you this drawing. But basically, these molecular orbital diagrams you can't answer them without memorizing this type of structure. Now, I just want to point out that these, there's two different drawings here. So don't think of it as this like arrow. I would just like cut this down the middle and just uh, work on, you're either dealing with this one or you're dealing with this one. Okay. So you're not going to be dealing with, you know, both at the same time. The, the thing here is we just have to basically, let me just resize this. We basically just have to figure out what elements go with what, right? So he, for, um, I believe for the left side, yeah, for the left side is going to be three elements. So for the left side, AKA the drawing on the, you know, this one right here, let me just circle it. So the drawing on this side is basically going to be if you have oxygen as your uh, element that they're talking about, fluorine and neon, okay? So you're going to have to draw this molecular orbital diagram if they're talking about like O2 or F2 or if they're talking about neon for some reason. I don't know why they would talk about neon, but basically if they give you like O2 or F2, you're drawing this. This one is basically all your other elements. So if, if you're talking about lithium, if you're talking about beryllium, if you're talking about boron and carbon and nitrogen and basically everybody else, okay? So that's the first step is you have to analyze what element did they give you and then you just say, okay, I'm going to draw this or I'm going to draw this one. So hopefully that makes sense. Now I just want to make a point here that the only difference between these two is basically this top drawing over here. Do you see how on the bottom there's like two lines, but when you come over here, the bottom one is only one line. So the P's are basically the difference between uh, these two. And I, I believe this is Enoch. I think that's how you pronounce it, but hello. Thank you, welcome. Welcome to Kim. Okay. Oh, thank you. Love the videos and liking this video. Thanks. Oh, you guys have been so kind. Thank you. I really do appreciate you guys. Um, okay. What number were we doing? We were doing 40. <laughs> All right. So I'm looking at 40. There's A through F. And 
you know, basically, you know, it really doesn't matter which one you, you, you pick, right? So I guess we'll go with, uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll go with, I guess, I guess we'll go with F2. We'll do G because maybe we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll do this drawing. So I'm going to basically, let's see, I'm going to get rid of this one. So hold the phone. I'm going to get rid of this one. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to like white out, um, this side. Because remember, if we're dealing with F, pay no attention to the other one. So I'm just going to magically get rid of the other one. Okay. So now we have this as a drawing. I'm going to get rid of this. And now I'm just going to put the, uh, I'm going to put the, um, the actual question. Okay, so for number 40, we just have to predict the molecular orbital configurations and then state whether, you know, one of them are not stable or unstable. So in order to do these types of questions, the, the first thing is you have to draw your diagram. It's the easiest way. It's a little tedious, but I think that it's the easiest way. So what's going to happen is basically what you have to do is you have, ooh, oh boy, you have two elements coming together on this molecular orbital diagram. So on this side, we have one fluorine. So I have an F here. And then on this side, I have the other F. Now, before we even write anything in the middle, we're going to write how many electrons we have on both sides. So let's see. Remember your valence electron configuration for fluorine, right? Now fluorine is in group 17. So I'm just going to say valence, right? If we did the electron configuration, it would be, actually we'll do the whole thing, right? It's 1s2, but then the valence is 2p2, uh, 2s2, and then 2p5. Now this is like way in. So now what's going to happen is we don't care about this one because there's only, uh, this has the valence electrons, right? And these are represented as the S's and these are your P's. If you notice, and maybe if this is a little bit too small for you, um, the, the, the diagram is in your textbook, but there are little S's here. You see how there's like an S and a P and a P and a P and a P and a P. So this is where all of your S electrons go. And these are where all your P's go, right? So let's work with the S's first. We have two S two here. That means that we have two electrons. So for the one fluorine, I'm going to write that I have one. Remember we write those electrons as lines. And then I have two of them, so I have the pair. Now, for the P's, I have a total of five, right? So I have to write five electrons divvied up between three lines. So I'm going to say one. And remember, the kids on the school bus, right? They want to be in separate seats. They don't want to double up right away. So you have to go one, two, three, four. Now you double back. And you say four, five. Do the same thing for the other fluorine. So one, two, and then one, two, three, four, five. Oop. Four, five. And now we include the charge. So in this case, plus two means that we lost two electrons. Oh boy, I just realized that I'm totally in that, that thing again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to Hold on, guys. Sorry about that. That was my fault. Let's see. Let me just get rid of this. And then I will put it, I will put the new one in. 
Okay. There we go. This is the question. I'll put it below here. Okay. So plus two means that we lost two electrons. So I have to be fair, right? If I lost two electrons across the whole thing, makes sense that I would lose one from one fluorine and one from the other fluorine. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to strip away the last electron. So basically this would just be like this now, right? For both of them. Okay, now we're ready to write the molecular orbital diagram. And you always start with the lowest because this is the lowest energy and we go higher up. As you're going from S to P, you're increasing in energy. And remember what we said earlier, right? Two things for chemistry, lowest energy possible and that's the most stable. So we don't want electrons really in the highest part here, right? Because that's way high energy. So I have total of four electrons here. You have to just basically start at the lower level and go up until you get to four. So one, two, I have to finish this before I go on, right? Three, four. Now let's do this one. Two, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I have a total of eight electrons that I need to go from the bottom to the top. So one, two, I have to complete this before I go on to this one. Three, kids on the school bus, four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go. Hopefully this uh, alignment makes sense. Now all we have to do is we now have to just take this information and write it out. So always start from the bottom, right? So here we go. We're going to start from the bottom and usually how they draw it is they draw it in little uh, parentheses. So we're gonna say that we have a sigma S now, specifically, we were talking about the 2s, so it would be sigma 2s, close it up, that's raised to the second because there was two electrons here. Then we go on to the next one. We have a sigma star. Just, rem just know that, you know, anytime that you see a star, it's literally a antibonding. Antibondings are not uh, as favorable as the bonding ones. And it kind of makes sense. Antibonding is always higher than the bonding. This is 2s. Close it up. There was two electrons. And then we just keep going. So we, now I have to talk about this one. So I'll open the parentheses again. Looks like I have a sigma 2p. If you want to call this a, you know, 2p, I think, I believe this is a 2px because these are your X's and then Y and Z. So this is 2PX, this is Y and Z because there's three different P's. So 2PX, close it up, there was two electrons. You're, you guys kind of get the drift, right? Then I have to incorporate these two. Now they're on the same level, so usually they will uh, have them both in the same parentheses. So I have pi, 2py, comma, pi, 2pz, close that up, and that's now to the second. And then I'm just going to drop down here, but technically it would be one uh, line still. And now you just have to talk about this one. So I will open up the brackets or the parentheses, I will say pi star p comma pi star p and if we want to call this this would be you know y and z and then put the two there and I just realized that there was a total of four electrons here this one should have been to the fourth because there was four total electrons and then this one is to the second because there was only two electrons. So that's basically how to do a molecular orbital diagram in a nutshell, and then how to do the valence 
drawing. So hopefully that makes sense <laughs> in a nutshell. But hopefully, fingers crossed that your teacher or professor will, um, you know, give you this diagram so that you don't have to memorize it on a test or a quiz because that would just be, that would just be mean. Okie dokie. I think for the most part, we've done a lot for this chapter. So I think, I think, I think we did it. We did hybridization. We did uh, central atom. We did MOs. We just drew the valence. So we are good with that. I, I think you guys have got the gist. What do you think? Hopefully this is good. <laughs> All right. Um, I mean, this was, this was really fun. This was my first live stream. So I, you know, thank you guys. You guys have been great. I really hope that this helped. Oh, thanks, Lexi. Lexi says, you're an amazing instructor. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this has been great. Oh, thanks, Peach. Thank you so much for our, all the vids. They helped me a ton. You're welcome. I really do want you guys to succeed. Yara says, thank you so much. You guys are great. Um, I really do appreciate all you guys. You guys have been working so hard. Um, and I love talking to you in the comments. So, and I, I really hope that this, this one helped. Um, you know, I'm sorry that I haven't gotten to these questions yet sometime, hopefully. Um, but I mean, I really did, I really did have fun and maybe, you know, maybe in the future, maybe we could do some more live streams. I'm just curious what, um, are you guys doing like AP chem or are you studying for like the MCAT or are we just taking chem? Are, are we doing any like standardized tests in the, in the future or what, what is, uh, what do you, what do you, what are you guys doing? Cause maybe if we could get like a systemized thing, um, if, if there's like a standardized test, maybe we could do more live streams to basically get you prepared for that test. Oh, intro to chem at Penn State. Look at that. That must be really fun, Penn State. My cousin goes there. Oh, Pete says, I'm in Chem 101. Okay, cool. So it looks like we're just basically in chem and... uh just for like a, um, just for like a class, but not like AP, AP chemistry or like studying for the MCAT or anything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah. Out of the, uh, 50,000 or people that go to Penn State, right? I mean, it's crazy. Final exam in May. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I would love to, uh, do more of these for the final exam. Is your exam, is your final exam cumulative? Probably. You can't get away from that, especially in chemistry. <laughs> um, but yeah. All right, guys. I think it is closing time. It is, it is 10, 15 around my, my end. So got to pump out more videos for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this has been really, really, really fun. And I, and I hope, and I hope that you guys have learned something from it. So yeah, I really did appreciate this and I appreciate you guys. So with that, if there's no other little things, I think we're going to conclude this. Oh, and it'll cover two new chapters. Okay. So 10 and 11, and then you guys are done. Well, one class is done. Oh, that's going to be fun. 10 and 11. That's fun. All right. Oh, thank you, Yara. Have a great night. Thanks again. Really appreciate everything. You're welcome. It is my pleasure. You too, Peach. Have a nice day. Thank you so much for everything. You're welcome. All right. So let's keep working hard. I feel like I have to say my ritual, right? You got to keep working hard. I believe in you guys. I know you're going to do well. And let me know how you did on, you know, the next test. All right. I'm rooting for you. And I will see you in 
the other lessons. All right. I hope you have a great night. Okay. Bye-bye.